first case on this morning's docket. I call case number 103304, State of Kansas v. Melvin D. Pherson. Please, the court. I'm Heather Sosna with the Appellate Defender Office here on behalf of Mr. Frierson, and I would like to request four minutes for rebuttal time, please. Four minutes is granted. Thank you. Um, and I will start off this morning talking about the alternative means on the aggravated burglary in this case, which is issue number one in the brief. Um, as this court is aware, the briefs in this case and the petition were all written and granted before the Brown case came down. I did file a 609 letter uh, bringing Brown up, and it is our contention that even under the new analysis in State v. Brown, that uh, aggravated burglary presents alternative means. Um, I think that under the analysis in Brown, um, there's a couple different uh, elements that, or there's a couple of different considerations that make these alternative means. Uh, specifically, what we're talking about with the burglary is the entering in or remaining within, um, entering into or remaining within. And our contention is that um, under Brown, that those are such significantly distinct conduct um, that they actually constitute alternative means. Uh, and we are relying on, um, I think, the distinction that's made in Brown. I think the discussion that uh, that this court had regarding the Washington case, um, Peterson and Brown, that kind of differentiated between the Washington statutes on offender registration and their theft statute is applicable here. Uh, in that case, they were talking about the Washington court, and this court was discussing um, the theft statute in Washington uh, had the overarching uh, uh, element was that that obviously something was being taken without authorization. But the acts that went into that, the exerting unauthorized control or the theft by deception, were distinct acts. And the Washington court determined that those were alternative um, that those acts were so distinctive that they were alternative acts. And our argument here is that while the burglary statute in our state um, obviously requires that the person enter into um, or remain within, I mean, ultimately, they're there without authority, either way you look at it. But I think the act of entering into a building versus the act of essentially refusing to act with, by not leaving when that authorization has been revoked is a distinct act that constitutes an alternative means. Um, so our contention is even under the new analysis of Brown, those are still alternative means in Kansas. How is the evidence of remaining within insufficient? Well, and I, this, is, this, is, this, is the, this is where we're asking that um, essentially this court, uh, with all due respect, <laughs> uh, either back, um, back away from or overrule the Gutierrez finding that the uh, entering into or remaining within is uh, not, um, is, I mean, we, we need them in order to win on the sufficiency issue. We need the, this court to say that the... Uh, that they're mutually exclusive. exclusive. Okay. And so that's that's the part that we need overturned in, in Gutierrez. And I will be upfront with the fact that if this court is not going to back away from that finding, then we do lose the sufficiency issue in this case. So um, so our argument is dependent upon that. And if that if they are mutually exclusive, then the sufficiency argument would go that the um, if the entering into and the remaining within are mutually exclusive and the remaining within requires that you had initially had permission to be there and that was revoked and then you remained within, then in our case there's no evidence that my client had permission to be there in the first place and that that was revoked. If there was only evidence that he entered into the residence um, without authority and so that would be the, the insufficiency for the purposes of the alternative means. And how do we get there through the plain language? Well, we're just making this up. <laughs> Through the plain language of the statute? Right. I think I, I think the, the difference is that by reading the statutory language, if we don't say as that those are mutually exclusive, then essentially any time that you enter into a building, you're always going to be remaining within, even if it's for just a split second. And so our argument is that that renders where, that entering into language. I'm sorry. Where's the harm in that? That it... 
renders that statutory language well, used? Not, not really, because that picks up the uh, scenario where you do enter with permission, and you're told to leave, and you remain within. But that doesn't mean that can't overlap with the unlawful enterer also. You understand what I'm saying? It still that, has something to cover. Right. Well, and I guess that's the, I mean, our argument is that, that it primarily renders that, um, I mean, it, you literally would have to enter into and then immediately after entering into be given permission to be there and then have that permission revoked in order for there to be two separate acts because otherwise every time you enter into the building you're always going to be remaining within even if it's for that split second and if that permission is granted upon your initial entry then you're always going to be entering with permission and so I think that's where you get into a but, factual problem so that's but, where but that's sort of the the gravamen of, of Brown is that if the legislature was just trying to uh, describe different ways in which you can prove this this uh, material element, the material element is that you're you're in this building without consent, uh, with intent to commit a felony or theft therein, and the legislature saying, well, that that's that can be proved either by saying you went in without uh, authority, or you remain without authority, and the gravamen is lack of consent, seems to me. Well, and I, I mean, I guess that's where I back up to the, um, to the discussion in Brown that talks about that if there is such distinct conduct, and I, and I think the distinct conduct that we're talking about here is that the act of actually physically going into a building is very distinct, even if you're there to be there without authority to commit a felony therein, which is similar to both of them. The act of actually entering into a building versus the act of, or the lack of an act, as it were, of essentially refusing to move or refusing to leave, um, I think is distinct enough that that still creates alternative means, and that the legislature intended that to be two separate acts. The other way to look at it is the legislature didn't want to make that uh, an issue. If you're there and you're not uh, don't have permission to be there, it doesn't matter if you thought you could go in, uh, but was made clear. Uh, they just took that issue off the table. That's another way to look at at uh, the, the disjunctive. Well, and I and I suppose that I think that that even if that is what they were trying to cover, I think they can still intend that to be alternative means of committing the same crime, even if they're trying to cover both venues. Um, so, I mean, I think even if I mean clearly they were trying to cover both situations. So, I think that that still doesn't necessarily negate the argument that those are such distinct acts that the legislature still created alternative means when they put that forward. Let's talk about restitution. Sure. Um, here, Mr. Furson had a sentencing hearing in which they ordered $950, right? Correct. And the judge announced at that hearing that the restitution amount would be held open for 30 days? Uh, correct. I think there were some outstanding medical costs that were not fully determined at the, the time. It was the dental stuff. Right. And, the, and defense counsel didn't object to that? That's correct. And then there was an order issued without any further hearing. Is that right? Right. Okay. There was no additional hearing on that. So you're saying that second order was without jurisdiction? Right. That the second order, we're not challenging the initial order of restitution at the sentencing hearing. What about Cooper? Um, and our argument is, I mean, first of all, as we argued in the briefs, that Cooper was wrongly decided that the holding open of restitution violates the plain language of the statute. Um, obviously, this court has since discussed this in State v. McDaniel, which I also um, included in my 609 letter. Um, and I think I can distinguish this and say that I think the difference here is that this is not a situation where the district court wholly held open um, Hold open the restitution and then didn't finish imposing it till later. I think part of the problem here is that they did impose restitution. And so at that point, I think even, I mean, I would argue that under McDaniel, essentially, that even if, you know, Cooper is still good law, you've essentially already completed sentencing, as in Troxel or any of those other cases that hold that once sentencing is complete, that you can't move on. And so then the subsequent addition or, or reopening of the restitution would still be without jurisdiction at that point speaking of jurisdiction how do we how do we even consider that the notice of appeal was filed july 23rd and uh the restitution order that you're complaining about was august 19th 
Well, and Your Honor, at the time, and this is, a, this is I mean, with some leniency here, I will definitely address your question. And I will say up front that, obviously, at the time that we initially filed these briefs, the jurisdiction question wasn't um, fully presented to us, I suppose. I think that a lot of that came up after the fact, after Big Daniel came out. Um, I think my response to your question is that, um, if anything, this would be a uh, premature notice of appeal, and under the... Um, State v. Rios, which I believe is a Court of Appeals case, but... Um, the problem with that is that you've just explained that there were actually two restitution orders. Right. Well, and I guess that's the thing, is that if there, if there was jurisdiction, I mean, if this court determines that there was jurisdiction for that second restitution hearing, then I think you've got a premature notice of appeal. Our argument is that there wasn't jurisdiction, and so our notice of appeal is really in time um, from the original sentencing. So, I mean, there's there, assuming that you would find that there is a jurisdictional problem here because of the second restitution hearing. Um, our argument would be it was merely a premature notice of appeal and that we should be able to continue going forward anyway because clearly the defense intended to appeal this case. What was the wording of the uh, notice of appeal in this case? Was it all adverse rulings? or? Um, I don't off the top of my head remember. I can check. Know. You want me to check now? or should I? No, you can just do it on and let us know on rebuttal. I just want to double check it. Yeah, I will double check it. I brought the record with me. And why in the usual case doesn't the premature notice uh, rule cure any problems the defense counsel might have in restitution cases? I'm sorry. The order is entered after, after the notice of appeal is filed? Can you reset why, that? Why doesn't the premature notice of appeal rule cure any problems that a defendant would have if he has filed or he she has filed a notice of appeal before that final restitution order is entered? You mean if we wanted to challenge that second restitution order? Right. I mean, I think it could. Um, I think our argument initially is that there wasn't jurisdiction for that right. in the first place. We're talking about two different Assuming jurisdictions, that. appellate jurisdiction and trial court, trial jurisdiction. court jurisdiction. She's talking about appellate jurisdiction. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, um, as far as the premature notice of appeal giving this court authority to consider the, or are you referring to the district court's authority to do the second hearing. No, the this court this to courts. hear. I mean, you know, the argument for one of the reasons Cooper should be mm -hmm. uh, re-examined is because of the uncertainty of when to file a notice of appeal. Right. And d do we really have that problem given the premature notice rule? Well, certainly the Court of Appeals has indicated that we have a problem. <laughs> I have uh, quite a few petitions pending in other cases where they've dismissed that for even with subsequent hearings. So um, um, I would argue that certainly that's a point that needs clarification uh, <laughs> for very, everyone involved. <laughs> at the very least, you would have to have the generic language to which right, you'd have to have the generic language alluded because if you just simply listed the journal entries that had been filed, then our case law says, no, that didn't pick up the then later. You, then you have a scope of jurisdiction problem. Right, right which is a slightly limits. different problem. I mean, I, I certainly have seen, um, you know, then list out, i certainly seen plenty of the notices of appeal that list out the trial, the sentencing, a motion to suppress, and all adverse rulings, or just all adverse that rulings. That have been made or might be made in the future. Right. Yeah, I mean, so I guess <laughs> if you <laughs> So I suppose if your notice of appeal doesn't... Okay cover that broad spectrum, then then yes, that might be a jurisdictional problem. Okay. And you're going to check that? I will check that. Great. Um, I'm out of time, so I will certainly submit the rest of my issues on the brief unless the court has other questions. Any further questions of counsel? Thank you, counsel. Thank you. May it please the court, Assistant District Attorney Leslie Isherwood appearing on behalf of the state. The majority of our argument will be confined to the first issue. At the time of prosecution in this case, Mr. Frierson was charged and prosecuted under the theory that he entered into or remained without authority in the apartment of uh, Otis Webb for the purposes of committing an aggravated robbery therein. At the time of that prosecution, the interpretation of that offense from this court in Gutierrez was that those two uh, uh, elements were not mutually exclusive, and he was... Uh, properly prosecuted under that theory. The evidence reflected that he did not have permission to enter the residence, that upon entering the residence, he and his cohort pinned Mr. Webb to the ground, battered him, uh, robbed him of $950, and left approximately 10 minutes later. 
the defendant would now like to look back on his conviction and argue that the alternative means principle warrants reversal of his conviction. In Wright, this court told us that alternative means arises when you have two truly distinct and materially different means of committing a crime. This court has already told us in Gutierrez that these are not mutually exclusive elements because it can necessarily embody the type of situation we have here where the individual both enters and remains without authority. Therefore, it would be the state's position that alternative means only arises if this court is willing to wholly depart from Gutierrez and find that remaining within occurs only in those situations where the individual previously had authority, it was subsequently revoked, and nevertheless he remained within the dwelling. That is not what we have here. The defendant was properly prosecuted. The evidence was sufficient to establish that he entered the residence without authority, that he remained without authority. If this court should find that this does present an alternative means situation, the state would respectfully argue that the conviction must still stand under a harmless error analysis. The prosecution was keyed solely to whether he entered and remained without authority. The evidence was pinned or pointed to that theory specifically. He received a fair trial on that theory, and the jury returned a unanimous verdict on that theory. It's really not even going to harmlessness, is it? It's just saying we have sufficient evidence. There's no error. I mean, if, if, if we were to, I think we have some um, uh, precedent that predates our Brown uh, decision that said these are alternative means. And then, of course, we did a different kind of analysis, or I, I should say a more kind of uh, complete analysis of what an alternative means case is in Brown. But even if we were to stick with that old rule and say they're alternative means, isn't, isn't this just a situation where, under Guterres, you have evidence of both? They're, they're legally distinct concepts, but they can overlap Yes. Actually, and you have that overlap here. True. He didn't have any permission to stay there and beat the guy. No. Yeah. No. Okay. So it's not really, you don't even have to worry about harmlessness. It's a no error situation, I think, is your argument. We would say, we would say no error under Gutierrez, but if you're going to depart from Gutierrez and make them okay. completely separate and distinct, we would say that it is uh, preserved under a harmless error analysis. Right. And for that reason, we would request that his convictions be affirmed. As far as the restitution <coughs> issue goes, um, the issue, the first aspect of the issue raised is that any hearing was conducted without jurisdiction, and in State versus McDaniel, this case, this court uh, determined a like issue and found it adversely to the defendant's position. In the second aspect of the issue, his argument is that the later amount uh, was essentially a modification of his sentence, and it was impermissible. This court considered a like issue also in McDaniel and found that it wasn't a modification, but a completion. And that is essentially. In that case, we had a second hearing, though, <laughs> and, it, and it was a continuance, or at least announced to be a continuance by the state. Here, we don't have another hearing, and we do have some of the restitution being ordered initially. I don't remember now, off the top of my head, on McDaniel, whether there was any restitution ordered initially. I don't think there was. I don't recall specifically yeah. in McDaniel, but it would be the state's position that it's a distinction without a difference, whether you're going from zero restitution to a solid figure or whether you have a certain sum imposed and then an additional sum imposed. He was on notice. What about the um, potential due process implications of a defendant being present or not when restitution, the, the restitution amount is set? He was, he was put on notice. He was aware that the additional sum was coming in. The documentation was provided to defense counsel. Is it a critical stage of the proceedings, though, that the defendant has to be present for? Um, I would say that the defendant was essentially present because he was notified that he was going to be obligated to pay restitution. The documentation was provided to him. He was aware of the sum that was going to be imposed, so the necessary notice was provided to You're him. You're saying notice of an ex parte, that we're going to do this ex parte, satisfies notice and opportunity be heard of due process? The de defendant um, at the initial hearing was aware that this um, additional sum was going to be um, imposed. I don't recall if at that time if there was an agreement between them, between them whether there was going to be another hearing or not, but the defendant was aware that that was open-ended and that an additional sum was going to be imposed and that the documentation would be forthcoming. So it wasn't as though he was completely blindsided with respect to the imposition or the sum. So he, 
I'm sorry. So he had an opportunity, in your view, to object and then another hearing to be held? That's correct. He was afforded the necessary opportunity to object to the continuance, and when the documentation is provided, he has the opportunity to object at that point and specifically request an additional hearing. But as it stands, he was aware from my recollection of the record, and it will speak for itself, that uh, the additional sum was going to be imposed. So if, so if the original sentence in any criminal case, uh, if there's a sentencing hearing and the defendant is absent, that's okay? No, that's not what I said. What I said was that um, the, the, at the initial sentencing hearing, the first portion of the restitution was conducted. The defendant was put on notice at that time and was made aware and agreed to the procedure that was forthcoming. He had the opportunity. It wasn't as though they proceeded um, and he was, he was uh, ignorant of how it was going to be conducted and that he had no opportunity to, to be put on notice or to speak on his behalf. This wasn't a situation where he was wholly cut out of the process. You're well, saying he had an opportunity to appear. He didn't take correct. it. Correct. So, was, uh, sorry. So, if there's a notice sent to the defendant for the original sentencing, uh, there's no right for him to show up. He does have a right to show up, and well, he exercised. He... he exercised his right by not showing up. To, to deny him the right would be to deny him the denote, to deny him the notice and deny him the opportunity to appear, and that's not what we have here. There is no indication from the record that he was denied any opportunity to appear or speak on his behalf. All information was communicated to him from, from point A to point B. There's no indication from the record he was ever cut out of the process or, or denied notice or denied an opportunity to present any argument or speak on his own behalf. But it's the defendant's obligation to speak up and say, I need to have a sentencing hearing. Is that what you're telling us? That's, that's what I'm telling you based on the way this um, was agreed upon between the parties as to proceed. He, he was at the initial sentencing hearing he was present when the initial restitution was imposed. He was present when the dialogue was conducted about this needs to remain open because not all of the medical bills are in. The documentation will be provided to you. And so at that point, the defendant is in agreement with the manner in which this is going to proceed. We can't uh, presuppose he has an objection. It is not our obligation to assume that he has an objection, enter that objection, and demand a hearing. If he has an objection to the procedure which he has previously agreed to and now wants a hearing, yes, that obligation is on him. Did that agreement include that there would not be an evidentiary hearing once the documentation was submitted? The record will speak for itself on that. I don't recall that specifically from the record. If there are no what further what if the I, have, I have one with regard to the agreement. Can I go ahead? Mm -hmm. You've said a number of times that this is okay because there was an agreement. But can the parties agree to uh, invest the district court with jurisdiction? I think we've said that that can't happen. And if statutorily there can be no modification, then they can't agree to invest the district court with the jurisdiction to do a later modification. I would, I would agree that, that technically that is correct, but this court has previously held a multitude of times that 2234-24 does not um, deprive the court of jurisdiction to complete what it has previously started. So I guess that was sort of my question, too, is if there had been an objection, because I think in McDaniel there was an objection at the, at the original sentencing hearing, to the, uh, to the amount. But let's say that defendant says, no, I, I object to continuing the hearing. What happens then? I think he is entitled to a hearing at that point. But we don't have that here. We don't have an objection and a demand and a denial of a restitution hearing. What if the defendant just objects to continuing restitution at all? I don't know... Because the defendant has an obligation under the statute to, to submit restitution and to make the party whole. 
I don't know that he has the ability to dictate how much restitution he's going to pay by uh, denying the ability to uh, compile the appropriate figure. But that's all a function of when the sentencing hearing gets set, right? I mean, the sentencing hearing could always be delayed. Let's just talk about some other options that are available here. I mean, the, the sentencing hearing, Kansas doesn't have any particular rule, at least as of yet, about when the sentencing hearing has to be held. You're supposed to do it soon, but it's sure. vague. And there's really nothing to prevent the state other than a situation where someone has a medical problem that's unresolved. Sure. Other than that, there's really no reason why the state can't get its evidence together by the sentencing hearing, assuming the sentencing hearing is set at a time that's reasonable for that purpose. True. Right? Okay. Good. I want, I want to ask another question, another jurisdiction question, but this one's about appellate jurisdiction. Okay. And that that is that premature notice of appeal kind of idea. Um, here we had the notice filed the day after the sentencing hearing. Yes. So as my colleague pointed out a moment ago, well in advance of the issuance of the order that completed the restitution yes. piece of the sentence or, or added to it or modified it depending on your point of view. Um, is there any problem with appellate jurisdiction? I think there is a problem with appellate jurisdiction because, because the notice was premature? Well, because um, the notice was essentially filed. I mean, yes, I guess you would categorize it as premature. We have a rule covering that. My, my other colleague asked about that earlier. Right. Why would that not work to cover it, assuming the language is broad enough? I'm not talking about scope now. Right. I'm talking about timing. Um, I would assume that there would be some wiggle room if that language is indeed broad enough. I don't know that that's necessarily the case here, but from a general perspective, and as we have seen in our cases, that um, jurisdiction is essentially um, once that notice of appeal is filed, he no longer has the opportunity to appeal anything that comes subsequent to that. So we, it would be our position. The word it is that if, it, if the notice of appeal comes between, before, pretty much between the announcement of a judgment and the journaling, journalizing of it, it's wording to that effect. Isn't that kind of, in principle, what happened here? He now, he, there was an announcement that there would be restitution paid, the amount was held open, and then the or a portion of the amount was held open and then it was journalized later there, with no hearing, no objections from either side to that procedure? Um, arguably, yes, okay. because essentially that, that journal entry that would be appealed from is is incomplete, but it is... Because uh, to me, I don't think the, cake, the state can have its cake and eat it too. Sure, you know? sure. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the problem when you have a rule like that. You, you can, you, we can, we can impose it and he can't appeal it. Seems like, well, you can I have think one or the other, but you can't both. Arguably, under that approach, it could loop in that okay. additional restitution. All right. Depends on the wording of the rule and the interpreting case. Correct. Okay. Thank you. If there are no further questions, the state would respectfully request that the defendant's convictions be affirmed. Let's assume that um, at the time of the discussion at the sentencing hearing about the continuation, it wasn't made clear that there would be, basically, the state could just submit stuff to the court um, would you agree that an evidentiary hearing normally should occur absent that is some kind of an agreement otherwise? I would agree, yes. I think that the defendant has, an has the right to be heard with respect to that issue. Um, but And it's an evidentiary issue. The court just can't look at, look at medical bills and decide the issue based on without evidence. Correct, but it would remain our position that I don't recall from the record that that is is how they proceeded in this case. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I guess I, and I guess you'd qualify that by what we originally held back in McDaniel's, as I'm recalling, was that a hearing has to occur prior to sentencing if it's requested under the statute. We interpreted the statute to say if it's requested by the family or the victim, it has to occur pre-sentencing. You recall that? That was the point of McDaniel. Right. The statute one, says that. One of yeah. several. Well, points. we interpret it to say that, yeah. Yeah. It's a little confusing, but yeah. That's how we got to saying you could have a hearing post sentencing anyway. Correct. That's how we got there in the first place. Right. Uh, with regard to the 223424 deed, yes. in, in this circumstance, would this fall within that uh, parameters of? of restitution being requested by the 
victim or the victim's family. I think that's how we've gotten around it before by saying, oh, well, the victim didn't ask for it. Well, yes, because specifically what held it over was the victim's medical receipts. It wasn't as though this was a, you know, compensation board issue or something like that. This is a victim specifically. And it would be difficult not to ascribe the, the restitution request to the victim in this case. Absolutely. Any further questions of counsel? Any further presentation? No, thank you. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Uh, just some points of clarification on the record. Um, the notice of appeal indicates uh, that he's appealing the judgment and the sentence of the district court. That's on page 40 of the second volume. Um, our argument would be that since this court has held that restitution is part of sentencing, that that language would be broad enough to cover the restitution issue in this case. Uh, certainly, uh, without the, that uh, sentencing language in there that might be problematic but I think this court's got jurisdiction even based on their notice of appeal um, and one of the other points I wanted to make was uh, there were some questions to opposing counsel regarding what exactly the district court said at sentencing um, volume uh, 12 page 21 is when the court orders this is at the sentencing hearing uh, is when the court orders the amount of $950 and he says I'll give the parties another 30 days for additional restitution and then he goes on to say talk about the cost of the case and the um, good time credits and all those kinds of things uh, so all he says is you've got 30 days for any additional restitution after that um, the restitution the notice of appeals filed after that hearing and then the order establishing restitution is filed um, approximately a couple weeks after that, and that's found on page, uh, it looks like 38 of volume 2. Uh, and the order establishing <coughs> restitution uh, is signed by a defense counsel, um, but there's certainly no indication or explicit waiver of presence by the defendant for that for another restitution hearing. There was no statement by the district court of we'll hold the restitution hearing unless you agreed otherwise. But there's the order signed by counsel. Order is signed by counsel. Prosecutor and defense. And the prosecutor and the defense counsel. Yes. So I mean, I think the problem here is whether or not uh, you know the as far as the defendant's right to be present. Certainly, we would. Can maintain that that's you know an evidentiary issue. It's a critical stage of the process. He um, would maintain the right to be present, and that absent some kind of explicit waiver of that, uh, defense counsel really isn't in a position to waive that for him. And there wasn't anything explicit said by the district court as to whether or not this was going to be a hearing, or that that hearing could be waived, or anything like that at the sentencing hearing. So hopefully that when kind of clears court up. Said we're going to hold it open. For 30 days nobody said we object to that procedure nobody said they objected to it and but it wasn't clear whether or not that meant that they were gonna have a hearing or whether or not that was just gonna be done in journal entry either so I hope that clarifies some of the factual questions that this court was uh, raising with respect to the lesser included offense um, appears to be the Court of Appeals was looking at whether all of the alternative means were contained in the greater offense. Uh, right. Tell me why, when it says all the elements of the lesser are identical to some of the elements of the greater, uh, I mean, as a, as a practical matter, it, it's sort of silly to say all the alternative means because if they're mutually exclusive it you couldn't be in the in the principle but under the language of all the elements are identical to some how do you how do you get there right well and not not to sound too Clinton-esque but our argument is essentially that the word all in the statute doesn't necessarily mean all of the alternative means it just means all of the elements of that of a specific of one of the alternative means and in this case that would be the intentional bodily harm uh, prong I mean there's four different ways to commit battery under that statute and so it would only apply to the intentional bodily harm way of committing that and that's wholly incorporated in the robbery and was that was the uh, lesser included instruction a preserved um, it was requested. That was the thing that I was, it was requested. Okay. Yes. Was it was specifically it wasn't requested. Today and I couldn't remember that. that one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I see my time is up. Thank you very much. Any further questions of counsel? No, thank you. Thank, thank you. you both for your arguments this morning. The court will take this matter under advisement.